Good morning. So what we will do is uh, we have uh, derived the one dimensional equations, Euler equations right and we have seen that it is possible to diagonalize uh, the Jacob flux Jacobian matrix and thereby decoupling the system of equations fine that is where we are. Uh, I was sort of deliberately loose when I was talking about how we go about the diagonalizing the matrix today maybe we will actually derive right it may get a little dreary but I want to I want you to know that these are not things that you flip open books and just check and whatever is in the book you take it for granted you should you should be able to do these things and you should be able to cross check whether the book has the data put in or the expressions put in right or in case you go on for uh, you encounter a problem later on in your career where the equation is not something that is sort of a standard text right that you know the process you know how to go about deriving. So what we will do today is we will actually look at I will actually derive the uh, eigenvalues and show you get the matrix right. So uh, if you get a little tired please bear with me right as I said these are these are things that one has to one should it otherwise it the easiest thing for me to is to come each time with a little cheat sheet saying that well these are the entries right I do it you take it down uh, but at some point you have to see that it can be done right for the flux Jacobians itself I hope you have tried out uh, evaluating the flux Jacobian the expressions it is a good idea it is a good exercise you should actually do it I mean it is just calculus but you should actually do it to make sure that everything is clear and that there are no issues okay. So first let me get the uh, what, what was that uh, let me get the expression right the way I want to do it I sort of set it up last class and then we will derive the eigenvalues we have already derived the eigenvalues I will derive the corresponding eigenvectors I will leave one part to you okay right. So what did we say the general problem we are looking at uh, in the non conservative form but in terms of the conservative variables this is the equation that we looked at and we asked ourselves the question when can I right how do I go about getting the diagonal form of this matrix A and you do what is known as a similarity transform. So if you get the matrix of eigenvectors and this is what I had written last time you get the matrix of eigenvectors this is the matrix of eigenvectors this quantity here is the matrix of eigenvectors lambda is the matrix of eigenvalues along the diagonals it is very clear that oops I am sorry it is very clear that if I pre multiply this by x inverse it is very clear that I will get x inverse ax equals x inverse x lambda which equals lambda right okay because sometimes uh, just like I did the FTCS first and it did not work you know there are there are certain things uh, if you look at the course the way we have done it so far okay just to give you an idea there is an underlying philosophy that I have here. So initially we did finite differences right representation and so on then we just did Laplace's equation no analysis we just jumped in it worked right but by the time we came to FTCS I of course deliberately chose FTCS because I know it would not work right we did we did a little analysis. Now if you notice we have come to a point once we are talking about this 1T flow I have not said anything about computing yet we are only doing the analysis you should get used to this right. So before you jump that is oh I have the equations let me start solving it you should sit down try to sort of digest what is happening what is the scheme what are the features what is likely to happen what is likely behavior it is a good idea to do it right. So you do not waste your time doing some kind of useless computation or whatever it limits the amount of time that you waste and you get a better understanding which is why we are going through this process so as you will you will notice that as we have gone along we are spending more and more time before we get to computation right okay. So what does this mean that means that real in reality as opposed to what I had written in the last class in reality what I want to do is I want to pre multiply this by x inverse the way I have written this so there has to be a connection between the two that is the point that I am trying to make. It is not enough just to put down the expressions. So I really want to pre multiply this equation by x inverse 
right I want to pre multiply this equation by x inverse so that okay I mean it is not that what I have written in the last class is wrong it is just that notational consistency is important okay. So that you get dou q caret dou t plus lambda dou q caret dou x equals 0. Correspondingly for a tilde there is an a tilde x tilde equals x tilde lambda because a tilde and a are related through a similarity transformation the lambdas are the same but the eigenvectors need not be the same that you will verify right what I will do is I will find the eigenvectors okay for the matrix A that is what I will do today. I would suggest that you make sure that you are able to find the eigenvectors for matrix I will find it for A tilde you make sure you are able to do it for A okay fine. I was exactly in the place that you are right now when I was taking this course and I did not make sure and I found out in my quiz that I had a difficulty. So I do not want you to be in that situation so make sure that make sure that you are able to right make sure that you are able to find the fine okay. So what do we have here so corresponding to this if I pre multiply by x tilde inverse I have x tilde a x tilde equals lambda okay fine. So what we will do is we will find and of course uh, just to just for uh, completion so if I were to multiply oops I am sorry not this if I were to take this dou q til, tilde dou t plus a tilde dou q tilde dou x equals 0 1D Euler equations written in non conservative form in terms of non conservative variables okay the variables are rho u and p if I were to multiply this by x tilde inverse I would again get dou q caret by dou t which is the same equation plus lambda dou q caret by dou x equals 0 the same equation okay we are transforming the dependent variable transforming the dependent variable. Let us find so the eigenvalues of a tilde or a we will find the eigenvectors a tilde has Eigen values, I will just put a uh, you know, a tilde has Eigen values u, u plus a, u minus a, okay. And what was a tilde? You remember? A tilde is a relatively simple matrix, do you remember? u, rho, 0, 0 u, 1 by rho, 0, gamma p u actually this matrix I really do not have a sort of a difficulty <laughs> remembering it because I know it is used along the diagonals and I remember the gamma p by rho that is here and there is a rho there you, you understand what I am saying right. So this matrix I do not have as much difficulty remembering okay fine that does not matter. So now we need the what do we want we how do you get the Eigen eigenvectors eigenvectors satisfy the equation. So let us find the eigenvector corresponding to u okay. So eigenvectors satisfy the equation so I will have uh, the characteristic equation is going to be u minus lambda rho 0, 0 u minus lambda 1 by rho, 0 gamma p u minus lambda acting on x1, x2, x3 right I should really have tildes here do not hold me to it if I forget the tilde's but anyway this equals the 0 vector right right. So if lambda is u this gives me 0 rho 0 0 0 1 by rho 0 gamma p 0 this is the system of equations on x1 tilde x2 tilde x3 tilde equals 0 and the corresponding equations are if I just write it out what is the first equation rho times x2 tilde equals 0 
that is that is nice. So, x 2 tilde is 0. Then x 3 tilde is 0. So, this is an easy one, right? x 3 tilde is 0. So, of course, it gives you if you, you would really take maybe x 1, x 2, x 3, x 1, 0, 0, or whatever. So, basically, the first eigenvector is 1, 0, 0. Fine. What about the next one? minus c rho 0, 0 minus c 1 by rho, 0 gamma p minus c, x 1 tilde, x 2 tilde, x 3 tilde equals 0. So, what does this give you? minus c x 1, U plus half. Sorry, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so it's very clear that sometimes I use C, sometimes I use A. Thank you. Sometimes because I, I don't want confusion between this and the do u do t plus A do u do x, I sometimes switch to C. In my mind, it's okay. It's fine. In my book, in fact, I think I use C. It doesn't matter. Okay. As long as we are consistent notationally, it's okay. It's good. Thank you but it is important right minus a x 1 plus rho x 2 equals 0 minus uh, a x 2 plus uh, x 3 tilde by rho equals 0 and the last one is gamma p x 2 minus a x 3 tilde equals 0. Suggestions? We can solve in terms of x 1, right. This is basically what you do. So, x 2 is a by rho x 1 okay and x 3 is a squared x 1 by is that right or just a squared a squared fine okay. So, the second vector therefore, uh, so, there are different ways to do it. You can make it orthonormal, you will see that the x1 will go away, or you can set x1 equals 1. There are some people who basically say, Why go through this headache? Make the first vector, first element entry 1 anyway, right? There are different paths that you can follow. I am not sure what you are familiar with, okay. So, we will just right now say, Okay, it factor out x1 or whatever. The second one is 1 a by rho a square. Can you tell me what is the last one? a rho 0, 0 a 1 by rho 0 gamma p a x 1 tilde x 2 tilde x 3 tilde equals 0 0 0. Right? All that has happened is some signs are flipped. So, this corresponds to a x 1 tilde plus rho x 2 tilde equals 0, a x 2 tilde plus x 3 tilde by rho equals 0 and gamma p x 2 tilde plus a x 3 tilde equals 0. Again you can say x 2 is minus a by rho and x 3 tilde is a squared a squared 1 minus a by rho a squared. So, this this is x tilde 
it is x tilde. Okay, so instead of just saying oh x tilde is the matrix of whatever I wanted you to see that is x tilde. What is x tilde inverse? So I promised you it will be a little dreary so just <laughs> bear with me what is x tilde inverse. There are different ways to do it I prefer to solve a system of equations especially when it is 3 by 3 that way I know I am not going to make any mistakes. So x tilde inverse basically I have what do I have? 1 0 0 1 a by rho a squared 1 minus a by rho a squared right this is for the inverse now this is for the inverse now I am just going to call them x1 x2 x3 right x1 x2 x3 I want to find these entries. Effectively I am going to take columns from the identity matrix so this is going to be 1 0 0 fine. So the first equation is x1 plus x2 plus x3 equals 1 nice. Second equation is a by rho x2 minus a by rho x3 equals 0. The third equation is a squared x2 plus a squared x3 equals 0 fine. What does this tell you? x2 and x3 are 0 right x2 and x3 are 0 and x1 of course will be 1 right. So in the inverse in the inverse where shall I write this I will write this somewhere here the inverse I am going to have 1 0 0 as one of the vectors okay what is the next one we find the entries for the next one by making this 0 1 0 the second column of the identity matrix right in which case that becomes 0 that becomes 1 that becomes 0 right I will wait for you to catch up it is easier for me to do this right. So what does this tell me hmm? x1 is 0 x2 plus x3 is 0 you substitute it there x1 equals 0 that is well, that is one thing that we get here x2 equals x3 x2 equals rho by 2a and x3 equals minus rho by 2a is that right. So then I have 0 rho by 2a minus rho by 2a and the last one yeah, you will have to sort of keep an eagle eye on me I may make a mistake here so 0 1 what is it going to give me zero. 1 by 2a squared 1 by 2a squared is that fine because x2 plus x3 is 1 by x2 plus x3 x2 plus x3 is 1 by a squared right so x1 has to have 1 minus 1 by a squared okay what about the others 1 by 2a squared 1 by 2a squared what is this this is x tilde inverse okay. So what we can do is we can use that 
you can verify right so uh, even though all of this looks good you you know you should always you should always check so once i the first time i derived this i sat down i made sure xx inverse was identity matrix i make sure that x in, x i made i verified see there are there are remember this, this is a very critical part of any derivation that you do you make a sanity check on the results that you get that you make sure that these actually do, do give you the eigen values and this is an interesting exercise because there should be a relationship between how we stack the eigen vectors and how the eigen values come out okay so you should go through this process just to make sure that you understand what it is that's what's actually happening okay because as i said it's easy to just manipulate the chalk dust saying that oh i multiply by x inverse right and i should get lambda check it out that's a matrix and there is a critical component uh, the, you know there are small connections that you will make if you actually do this but it's a good idea always any time you do a derivation like this it's always a good idea before you proceed start coding and all of that stuff to make sure that what you've got is right right so it's supposed to be the inverse check that it's the inverse it's supposed to make this diagonal check that it makes a diagonal right okay just to be sure then you can go on fine okay so what was the deal what we basically got was what we basically got was if we were to multiply this if you were to multiply so the equation do q tilde equation is do by do t of rho u p plus a tilde do rho u do rho u p do x equals 0 so if you were to pre multiply this whole equation by x inverse right it's supposed to diagonalize it right so if you were to pre multiply this equation by x inverse what you're going to get here what you're going to get here this is corresponds to if i want to do it in terms of differentials right what i'm basically saying is dq tilde if i pre multiplied by x inverse tilde is going to give me dq caret okay and this equation should then reduce to this equation that should then reduce to if i were to do that this equation will then reduce to some form that is like uh, i'm going to do that there so i'll write it here do q1 hat do t plus u times do q1 hat do x equals 0 okay do q2 hat do t plus u plus c times do q2 hat do x equals 0 and this is what I meant how do I know it is u plus c because the second Eigen value I substituted to get the Eigen vector was u plus c right there so there will be a relationship between all of them and the last one will be do q3 hat do t plus u minus c do q3 hat do x equals 0 so these are the three equations that we expect to get okay looking at this looking at this what is x x1 x inverse dq so that is uh, this matrix that i have here 1 0 minus 1 by a squared 0 rho by 2a 1 by 2a squared 0 minus rho by 2a 1 by 2a squared acting on d rho du dp is that fine and what will that give me what will that give me it says d rho minus dp by a squared is dq1 hat they get that right okay 
what is the second equation rho by 2a du plus plus dp into divided by 2a squared equals dq2 hat and the last one minus rho by 2a du plus dp by 2a squared equals dq3 hat fine. And it is possible that we are able to, it is possible that we are able to integrate these equations and find q1 hat, q2 hat, what they correspond to. Of course, what we know is along this, now you look at this one equation, right. Now think back to the wave equation, this, forget this equation. What does this equation say about q1 hat? So it says on the xt plane, on the xt plane. If you have at a point, right, if you have a value u, you take a slope, a line whose slope is 1 over u basically, right, and along this line, this characteristic, q1 hat is a constant, right, it, q1 hat is a constant because, because the right hand side happens to be 0. Remember this characteristic equation is very strange. If there was a source term, then q1 hat will actually change, right, you would have to integrate along that, fine, okay. So q1 hat equals 0 along this. That means along this line dq1 is 0, along this line dq1 is 0, along this line dq1 is 0, along that line, along the characteristic, along I will just say characteristic d rho minus dp by a squared equals 0, right, dp by d rho is a squared, that is the definition dp by d rho equals a squared when is the dp by d rho equals a squared on a p rho curve on a p rho graph right if I draw a path and say I find dp by d rho on that curve there is a particular curve where it is equal to a squared right that is on the isentrope okay right. So this basically says that since dp by d rho is a squared this tells, tells us that the entropy is constant along that line dq is constant along that line. It is almost as though the entropy is being propagated along that line. So if you had different values of entropy at different points along this line entropy is constant. Is that fine? Okay. Now integration of this I do not know whether you have seen all of this in gas dynamics. Have you have you done this? You have, so you have done this in gas dynamics. That is fine. Okay. So you can assume the flow is homentropic and so on and then there are ways by which you can integrate this. Right. Maybe so I will just write the typical characteristics that you get are do you remember u plus you can just check 2a by gamma minus 1 and u minus 2a by gamma minus 1. You can just go back and check, right. I am just writing this from memory. You can just go back and check, right. You may have seen this in your gas dynamics class, right. That comes from assuming it is homentropic. If it is homentropic, then P is like rho power gamma and A is like rho power gamma minus 1 by 2. Okay, I am sort of doing the calculation in my head, fine, square root of, right, and things of that sort. You can, you can work it out. You can actually go back. I am sure you have done it in gas dynamics. You can, you can derive these expressions, right. But we have made an assumption beyond this. I made an assumption that the flow is homentropic, right. It is not just constant along this line. It is constant everywhere. That is a strong assumption, right. It may, it may be valid a lot of times, but it is a strong assumption from where we stand. Is that fine? Okay. Normally, as I'd indicated in the in the last class, normally if you say that you have differentials related in this fashion, and you want to perform an integration and you want to find q caret, right? Normally, this works only if the curl of this vector column vectors is zero. Okay. So normally, you would want curl of x inverse to be zero in order to be able to invert it. Fine. Right, but that uh, we we won't go there. So in a, if you were to encounter, if you were to encounter a general problem, 
you may not always be even here I had to make assumptions that the flow is home entropic. it is not it may not be always A you may get an integral that you are not able to evaluate that is one thing. The other thing it may not even be integrable right just because you have a velocity field does not mean that the potential exists. So there is a constraint on the velocity field right there is a constraint on the velocity field so that you are able to obtain the potential. So in a similar fashion it is possible that you can integrate it may not be integrable is that fine okay. Right, we have now we have set up. We are able to get this. We know we can get the characteristic form. If we were to solve the equations actually in characteristic form, of course we don't know. We don't always know q1 hat q2 hat q3 hat. We may not be able to find it. The flow may not be homeentropic, right? So we so, we, but if you were to do it in terms of q1 hat q2 hat q3 hat, you would then be solving what we normally call the method of characteristics. We'll be using the method of characteristics, right? That's basically it. Not always viable especially if you go to multiple dimensions. So now let us see how would you actually solve this, how would we actually solve this equation and what I am going to suggest is I am going to suggest that uh, before you start coding maybe this uh, suggestion I could have made earlier so that you would have started doing this. Uh, before you start coding there are certain functions that you should start implement before you, before you even start coding right. So before I tell you how we are going to go about solving this. There are certain functions that you should implement. These are base functions that you will need whatever solver you are writing, right. So the idea is that you write simple functions that will do one thing, right and I will tell you each of those one things, what each function does and you test the function, okay, to make sure that it is doing what it is supposed to do, right. And once you have tested it, you can set it aside saying, okay, this works, fine. So if you have a collection of functions, base functions that you require for most solvers, and you have tested them you are confident then it is a matter of implementing the solver of course there may be other headaches that come then but at least you are not worried about the base functions being right or wrong okay you get what I am saying right. So that that ensures a certain degree of success right it guarantees at some level certain degree of success. So before I get to the solver I would suggest you first implement allocation of RS. What do I mean by that depending on the language that you are using whether you are using Fortran, C, C++, whatever. You make sure that you are able to allocate queues, you are able to create an array of queues, right. Remember Q itself has three quantities, right. So it is not, I mean it is not just a trivial thing, right. So if you have done it, you are, you are into programming in a big time, this may be nothing for you. But I would still suggest that you do it, right. Allocate, allocate Q, allocate Q tilde allocate E, these days we are not uh, worried that much about memory so I will just tell you all the things for the one dimensional thing that you can allocate you will worry about memory and you know how much memory it takes when you get to multi dimensional flows which is not part of this course anyway right A if you want A tilde X, X inverse right. Very often what we do is we calculate them as required but first you allocate make sure that you are able to do this. So if at, at any point along the way uh, it is not that you actually create it but you have functions that will do this right. So you will have a function that allocates Q, allocate Q right, allocate Q tilde. So it will give you, you will be, you will have, you will have something that will actually do it. I am not saying write one big function that does all of these right. I want functions that can, that can create arrays of. Am I making sense? Okay, fine. So in Fortran, for instance, if you wanted 11 grid points and you wanted to allocate Q, then it would be an array that has 11 by 3, right? In C, it may be, may be depending on you may have a struct, or in C++, you may have a class that has these three elements. It has other behavior, and then you would allocate 11 of them. Am I making sense? That's how you would go about doing it, and that would be Q alone. And then you do similar things for Q tilde and so on. Is that fine? Okay, right. Now you write other functions. Given Q, find Q tilde, right? Because you have rho, rho u, rho e t. I mean, very often we are not really interested in rho u and rho e t. We are interested in the speed. We are interested in the pressure distribution, right? Normally, that's that's the kind of thing that we are looking at. So, given Q, finding Q tilde. Your input to the program may also be in terms of Q tilde, but you may be solving it in terms of Q, 
right. So, you have to write another function given q tilde finds q. If you are keen you can also find q caret I leave that up to you right if you are 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 keen if you feel like it you can implement q caret what else given q find e right. So you have individual ones given q find a you may see repetitive calculations and so on but you are in the process of developing code please do not take shortcuts please do not try to optimize your code right your objective always is to get every bit of your code functionally correct it functions properly then we can worry about the optimization okay. Find a tilde or if you want q tilde find a tilde either way I, I, I leave that up to you make a decision make a decision and what else you obviously have these given q find x given q find x inverse. Fine. So, what what have we where are we right now you are able to allocate the memory there you have individual functions that do that and given any any of these quantities you are able to populate those arrays you understand what I am saying. So, as an initial condition if you are given q tilde you can find the q and from the q's you can then find all of them you can populate all of them now you are set right at this point you are set you have the array of right okay. You may find for instance if you are doing FTCS that you need two areas of q because you have the current time step and you have the next time step. These things you can handle as you go along because it depends on what how we are how we are going to what is the actual this is the base this you require so any one dimensional solver I would expect will require this any one dimensional solver I would expect will require this. You may there are auxiliary functions that we require okay now I, I just remembered because remember we had a stability condition stability condition required that we needed to find propagation speeds. So, maybe we need to find not just this but even the eigenvalues. So, given the q find u u plus a u minus a okay right good we are now we are now set given that we will do FTCS again. I mean I know it is not supposed to work but we will do FTCS again right okay. We have dou q dou t plus and there is a reason why I am writing this right plus dou e dou x equals 0. So, the first thing that I want you to notice is I am writing it in the conservative form the a dou q dou x was for the analysis right I am not going to use the a dou q dou x form I could also write this as dou q dou t plus a dou q dou x equals 0 they are they are they are mathematically identical right but this just involves a lot of computation it involves finding a right though I said you have all those functions you can choose not to allocate a and you can choose not to find a okay this involves finding a this does not. So, if I do not have to do this I am not going to do it we wanted that a form because we had done dou u dou t plus a dou u dou x equals 0 and we said oh I have done all that stability analysis for it I want to get it in that form that is why we struggled with this to get it in that form because that stability analysis all of that stuff will carry am I making sense. So, uh, so what do we have here how am I going to do FTCS here. So, I say q p time level q plus 1 equals q at p time level q minus delta t by 2 delta x e p plus 1 q minus e p minus 1 q fine is that clear. So, from the scheme that we have talked about you can allocate the q's you know the q at the current time given the q you can find the e's you know the e's at the current time you can find this difference therefore you can find the q at the new time step fine we are set right is do you think this will be unstable is this going to be unstable for wave equation was it it was unconditionally unstable do you expect this this will be unconditionally unstable 
how can we find out? Is there a way for us to find out? What do you say? There must be some way for us to do the analysis. So we can see whether whether we have choice. We can see whether we do the analysis now or not. I want you to verify something. I want you to okay. So we will the analysis part itself. It will turn out that yes, this is indeed unstable. Okay, so we, we but we will show it. Okay, but I want you to find. I want you to evaluate. I have we have derived, or I hope you have derived. I have given you the flux Jacobian A. I want you to evaluate what is A times Q. Right? You have the vector Q. You have the vector A. There are uh, Euler equations, you know, Euler, there are lots of nice things that happen with Euler equations. Uh, like a lot of beautiful symmetry and so on. So I want you to, I want you to just try this out. See, see, to find out a times q and see what you get. Okay, right? And maybe in the next class we'll come back and see whether we are able to do a stability analysis for this. You are of course in a position now to actually implement this stuff. But as I said before, you do this. Please, please make sure that you implement all those functions and test each one of those functions. Okay test each one of those functions. So I would normally when I say test each one of those functions I would say rho is 1, u is 100, p is 10 power 5 right then you know what, what should be the values of rho, rho u, rho e, rho e t. So I would check the individual functions to make sure that they are giving you the okay. So test, test each one of them make sure they are functionally correct right okay. So if we are set if this was stable we just March in March in time, right? If this was stable, we'd just march in time. Is there anything we have to worry about? End point, boundary conditions, end points, boundary conditions. So we have to worry about how we are going to apply boundary conditions, just like we did for FTCS in the wave equation case you have to worry about what happens to the boundary conditions. So before I start talking boundary conditions see all of this time I managed to carry you guys right all this time without actually talking about a specific problem I have just been writing equations right at some point you had to say what is the problem that we are going to solve I even written a discretization but when we come to boundary conditions I have no choice now I have to come out and say this is the problem that we are going to actually solve right. So the problem from gas dynamics so the typical gas dynamics problem would be I draw two vertical lines indicating a huge enormous reservoir right enormous reservoir we can decide where we want to put the valve I will put the valve here I will put a valve there and I sort of tied myself into a corner because I am taking one dimensional flow right. So I cannot I do not have area variations right at the end of all this analysis we will say okay we will let us do let us look at the quasi one dimensional equations and they are not that different from here they are little more interesting because you at least have area variations here you have no area variations at all right. So the length of this is L you can take unit length if you want so in this reservoir now I want you to think about the experiments if you have done an experiment in right gas dynamics lab or something of that sort. So what are the conditions that you normally know in the reservoir? You know the you know the total you know the condition stagnation conditions there the total pressure and total temperature. So you will know P sub zero that's the total pressure, and T sub zero that's the total temperature. Anything else? Not much. Not really much else. Okay. What about the right hand side? What do you know? You know the ambient pressure. So you say I have a pressure vessel that's at uh, five atmospheres or three atmospheres or six atmospheres or whatever. There's a little pipe coming out of it. And there is a valve that is what I have drawn and if you open the valve the gas from that chamber is going to exhaust through that pipe and come into the atmosphere. And the conditions here are P ambient or P atmospheric. Can we prescribe anything else? You could in theory measure the 
you could in theory measure the temperature in the lab right in theory you could measure whether I do not know from your gas dynamics you should realize that this is basically all that you will have right you could measure the T ambient what else can you measure that is it we are stuck now you just have to open the valve and let the let it run. So you open the valve and the gas starts to pour out there is an initial transient and then it settles down fine and there is a flow field that is set up we are interested in that steady state flow field right now we are not going to look at the transient we are interested in that steady state flow field what is that steady state flow field that we get okay. So if this length L I break it down using numerous grid points right so if I am going to this is a time level Q so if I, of course at time level Q plus 1 I have an equivalent so I can at time level Q plus 1 I have equivalent points and we know that the FTCS stencil looks like that those are the points that are involved okay the only difficulty is that when we come to this first interior point you end up having to use you end up having to use a boundary condition that is a problem okay that is a problem and then there is the issue of what is the boundary condition that I am going to have here. So what you have given me is only P0 and T0 and you have given me only two quantities okay how many conditions do we require from a differential equation point of view okay from the physics point of view I have T0, T0, P ambient the physics point of view we are happy right okay and you understand that whether T ambient is at 300 Kelvin right or 320 Kelvin or whatever T ambient as long as the pressure is the same you understand that the gas dynamics of this is not going to change it does not depend on T ambient we already know that it does not depend on T ambient. So we already know that from the physics point of view we need P0, T0 and P ambient that is what we need that is what the physics tells us what does the differential equation tell us differential equation has a dou by dou T is a Q you need three initial conditions and a dou E dou X a spatial derivative three conditions in space well we have two here and one there so we have the three conditions the physics and the mathematics are gelling right so there is no there is no issue here the problem that we have when we do FTCS is in order to take this time step I need Q there not three conditions two conditions here and one condition I need Q I want three conditions there and in a similar fashion when I come here I want three conditions here so my CFD because I chose FTCS requires three here three there what do I have I have two here one here so I have to somehow generate I have to generate three here one there is that fine two here one there I repeat that <laughs> maybe cut that out okay fine right we need to two here one there Am I, is that fine okay right okay so uh, now we basically say okay we have to justify get starting to wave hands a little more we have to justify how this is going to happen okay. So I, I ask myself the question what happens if P ambient is the same as P0 let us assume that instead of being instead of there is some magical way by which I could fiddle around with this downstream right there could be a pressure vessel here and I could figure out whatever P ambient I wanted so if P ambient was the same as P0 you would have no flow even if the valve is open if I lower P ambient right I have a pump that is starting to evacuate I lower P ambient what is going to happen I will set up a flow field the rho u the m dot here will increase right gas dynamics we are thinking m dot m dot will increase if I lower it even further the m dot will go down even further so this P ambient what I am able to control using P ambient is the m dot so if I lower the P ambient here the rho u entering here is affected by it am I making sense okay so it looks like somehow 
from here what needs to there is something propagating upstream I have to somehow take from within the interior I have to take this mass flow rate the p ambient has dropped more mass flow rate it has to be it has to be communicated upstream it is happening when you lower p ambient you know in your actual physical fluid flow situation when I lower p ambient you know that the mass flow rate increases upstream. So the fact that this p ambient has dropped either somehow that p ambient itself is propagated upstream that is one possibility or the u or rho u the increase in rho u the need for an increase in rho u is propagated upstream. So in my mind if I do an experiment I say if I lower the p ambient here well immediate, the immediate all of this if it is at uh, p, p naught right then the air here will get sucked out and it will propagate that wave will propagate upstream expansion fan or whatever it will propagate upstream right that is what I expect and propagate propagate upstream look at this propagate upstream all the way to the top all the way to the front fine. So maybe what we will do is we will have to look at exactly explicitly how we are going to apply these boundary conditions we have the problem set up we know what is the problem we are solving we know what is the scheme that we are using we have two issues that I have left unanswered in this class one is is that scheme stable if it is not stable what shall we do the second is how do we apply the how exactly shall we apply the boundary condition? we know that there is a shortfall we need two quantities on the right and one quantity on the left how do we generate is that fine we will do that in the next class right thank you.